Hi everyone, it's Professor Permanton. In this video, we're going to finish up our discussion on inverse trigonometric functions and their graphs. So in the previous video, we talked about how to understand and use the inverse sine and inverse cosine functions. And we actually talked about how to find the exact value of the expressions involving inverse trigonometric functions. And we also talked about the graph of the inverse sine and inverse cosine functions. In this video, we're going to talk about how to understand and use the inverse tangent function, how to find the exact value of expressions involving the inverse tangent function, how to use the calculator to evaluate inverse trigonometric functions, and how to graph the inverse tangent function. So let's pick up where we left off, the inverse tangent function. So again, if we restrict the domain of the tangent function to the interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, not including the endpoints, so we have open parentheses on negative pi over 2 and also positive pi over 2, in a similar way that we define the inverse sine function, this time we're not going to include the endpoints because those are actually vertical asymptotes for the tangent function. So again, the tangent function is not a one-to-one -one function on its entire domain. So we need to restrict the tangent function to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, not including the endpoints, so that the tangent function becomes a one-to-one -one function and it actually will have an inverse function. So we're going to choose this interval because the restricted tangent function actually attains each of its output values on this interval from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, not including the endpoints. And the range of the tangent function was the set of all real numbers. So if y equals tangent of x, remember that the domain is a set of all real numbers, x equals k pi divided by 2, where k is an odd integer. In other words, odd multiples of pi over 2, the tangent function is undefined. And so those actually came out to be vertical asymptotes. So you have vertical asymptotes at x equals negative pi over 2 and x equals positive pi over 2 because at those x values, the tangent function is undefined. So that means we need to restrict the tangent function to be between negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, not including the endpoints, and we get y equals tangent of x, which is called the restricted tangent function. And the range of this restricted tangent function is actually from negative infinity to positive infinity. It actually attains each of the y values or its output values on this restricted domain from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So if we restrict the domain of the tangent function to be only between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, not including the endpoints, and we reflect the graph across the line y equals x, then we get the inverse tangent function, which will be this graph. So the inverse tangent function, y equals inverse tangent of x, has a domain which is from negative infinity to infinity, or the set of all real numbers, and the range is from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, not including the endpoints. So you had vertical asymptote at x equals negative pi over 2, and x equals pi over 2 is also a vertical asymptote, when you reflect the graph across the line y equals x, they actually become horizontal asymptotes. So you have a horizontal asymptote at y equals pi over 2 and y equals negative pi over 2, and all the x values become the y values, and all the y values become the x values for the inverse tangent function. And so if we restrict the domain for the tangent function to be between negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, we can define the inverse tangent function on this restricted domain. So y equals inverse tangent of x is obtained by reflecting the graph of y equals tangent of x on the restricted domain where the x values must be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, not including the endpoints, about the line y equals x. And so the graph of y equals inverse tangent of x is the number in the interval between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 whose tangent value is equal to x. And the definition of the inverse tangent function, the inverse tangent function is the function tangent inverse with domain from negative infinity to infinity or the set of all real numbers. And the range of the function is from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, not including the endpoints. It's defined to be this, y equals inverse tangent of x if and only if tangent of y is equal to x. So you're trying to find out what is the value of tangent that will give you x, which is the input value for the inverse tangent function. The inverse tangent function is also called arctangent, and it's denoted y equals arctangent of x. So in fact, from the general properties of inverse functions, we have the following cancellation properties involving the tangent function now. So if you have a composition of inverse functions, they can undo each other, the inverse function and the original function undo each other, provided that the x is in the domain of the inside function. So tangent of inverse tangent of x the tangent function and the inverse tangent function will actually undo each other, and you'll just get x back, provided that x is in the set of all real numbers, which is the domain of the inverse tangent function. On the other hand, inverse tangent of tangent of x is equal to x only for x values that are in the domain of the restricted tangent function, which was from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, not including the endpoints. So if we talk about the restricted tangent function, that's this graph that's in pink or red, the y equals tangent of x is called the restricted tangent function. The domain is from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, not including the endpoints, and the range is from negative infinity to infinity, or the set of all real numbers. If you reflect this graph, y equals tangent of x, across the line y equals x, you actually get this graph that's in blue, which is called y equals inverse tangent of x. So the inverse tangent function, y equals inverse tangent of x, 
The domain is from negative infinity to infinity, or the set of all real numbers, and the range is from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, which is not including the endpoints. So the domain of the restricted tangent function is now the range of the inverse tangent function, and the range of the restricted tangent function is now the domain of the inverse function. And that's because, recall that the domain of y equals f of x is the range of the inverse function, and the range of the original function f of x is the domain of the inverse function. So in example five, we're going to evaluate the inverse tangent function. So find the exact value of the following trigonometric expressions. Number one, find the value of the inverse tangent function of zero. So again, we're gonna call y equals inverse tangent of zero. And so now we're trying to find out what is the y value between negative pi over two and pi over two, not including the endpoints, where tangent of y is equal to zero. So if y is between negative pi over two and pi over two, we're talking about quadrants one and four again. So where is tangent of y equal to zero if we're talking about quadrants one or four? Well, it must be the value zero. So inverse tangent of zero is equal to zero because tangent of zero is also equal to zero. So y must be equal to inverse tangent of zero, it's zero, which is between negative pi over two and pi over two, not including the endpoints. Number two, inverse tangent of negative one. So again, call y equals inverse tangent of negative one. And so this y value must be between negative pi over two and pi over two. And we're trying to find out where is tangent of y equals negative one, which is the input value for the inverse tangent function. So if the y value is between negative pi over two and pi over two, we're talking about quadrants one or four, but tangent is equal to negative one. The tangent function is actually a negative value. Well, the tangent function is negative in quadrants two or four. Well, the only one that overlaps is actually quadrant four. So we're talking about what is the angle in quadrant four where tangent is equal to negative one. Well, the angle is negative pi over four. So inverse tangent of negative one must equal negative pi over four. And then number three, let's find out the value of inverse tangent of square root three. So call y equals inverse tangent of square root three. So now we're trying to find out what is the angle y between negative pi over two and positive pi over two, not including the endpoints, where tangent of y is equal to positive square root three, where the y must be between quadrants one or four. Since tangent of y is square root positive three, it's a positive value this time. The tangent is positive in quadrants one or three. So again, we're going to be in quadrant one this time for the restricted tangent function to exist and also the tangent function also to be a positive value. So what angle in quadrant one is the tangent squared three? Well, that must be pi over three in quadrant one. So y equals inverse tangent of squared three is equal to pi over three radians because tangent of pi over three is equal to squared three. So recall that when we were evaluating trigonometric expressions involving the inverse cosine function, we needed to remember that the range is actually the domain of the restricted cosine function. The same is going to be true for the inverse tangent function and the restricted tangent function. The domain of the original function is the range of the inverse function, and the range of the original function f of x is the domain of the inverse function f inverse of x. So the domain of y equals tangent of x, that's the restricted tangent function, the domain is from negative pi over two to pi over two, not including the endpoints, which is now going to be the range of the inverse tangent function, y equals arctan of x. And the range of the restricted tangent function, y equals tangent of x, was the set of all real numbers. That's going to become the domain of the inverse tangent function, y equals arctangent of x. Example six, evaluating expressions with inverse tangent. Find the exact value of each of the following composite functions. Number one, inverse tangent of tangent of negative pi divided by six. So since negative pi over six is actually in the domain of the restricted tangent function, y equals tangent of x, where x is between negative pi over two and pi over two, since negative pi over six is actually in quadrants one or four, is actually in quadrant four, this inverse tangent of tangent of negative pi over six is actually equal to negative pi over six. The inverse tangent function and the original tangent function will actually undo each other or cancel each other out and you just get negative pi over six radians. Number two, inverse tangent of tangent of two pi divided by three. So again, this time x equals two pi over three is not actually in the domain of the restricted tangent function, which was from negative pi over two to pi over two, not including the endpoints. So since x equals two pi over three is not in the domain of the restricted tangent function, we need to find an x value that is between negative pi over two and pi over two, where tangent of two pi over three is equivalent to tangent of x. So since the x value must be between negative pi over two and pi over two, we're talking about quadrant one or four. Well, tangent of two pi over three, two pi over three is actually in quadrant two. Tangent is a negative value in quadrant two. Well, tangent is also a negative value in quadrant four. So we're trying to find out what is the angle in quadrant four where tangent of two pi over three is equivalent to tangent of that value. It turns out that the angle that's equivalent would be negative pi over three. 
tangent of negative pi over 3 is the same value as tangent of 2 pi divided by 3. And so now we can make that replacement. Inverse tangent of tangent of 2 pi over 3 is equal to inverse tangent of tangent of negative pi over 3. And since negative pi over 3 is actually between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, we actually have the inverse tangent function and the tangent function will undo each other or cancel each other out and you just get negative pi over 3 back. So inverse tangent of tangent of negative pi over 3 is equal to negative pi over 3, which is the value of inverse tangent of tangent of 2 pi over 3. Example 7. Using a calculator to e evaluate inverse functions. Use a scientific or graphing calculator to find approximate values for the following trigonometric expressions. Round your answer in radians to two decimal places. So number one, we're going to find out what is the value of inverse sine of 0 0.357. So make sure that your calculator is in radian mode before you actually evaluate the inverse sine, inverse cosine, or inverse tangent functions. So we want to find out what is the inverse sine function of 0 0.357. So we'll have second and then the sine function. Right above sine, you'll see inverse sine. That's in blue. So inverse sine of 0 0.357 the output value will be in radians, provided that you're in radian mode. So the answer is 0 0.3651, or if you round in two decimal places, 0 0.37 radians. And that's because sine of 0 0.37 is approximately 0 0.357. Number two, let's find out what is the value of inverse cosine of negative 0 0.887. So we're trying to find out what is the value in radians where cosine is equal to negative 0 0.887. So on the graphing calculator, you'll hit second, Cosine, right above cosine, you'll see inverse cosine. So inverse cosine of negative 0 0.887, close parentheses, and you find out the value is approximately 2.66 if you round the two decimal places. And then the number three, inverse tangent of 1.107. So again, make sure that your calculator is in radian mode because the answer needs to be in radians. We want to evaluate inverse tangent, so second and then tangent will be inverse tangent of 1.107. And the answer is 0 0.8361, or if you round the two decimal places, it'll be about 0 0.84. So now that we talked about the inverse sine, inverse cosine, and inverse tangent functions, let's talk about the other three. Inverse secant, inverse cosecant, and inverse cotangent functions. To define the inverse functions for secant, cosecant, and cotangent, we're going to again restrict the domain of each of those functions to a set on which the function actually becomes a one-to-one -one function and actually also attains all the output values on that restricted domain. Although any interval satisfying these criteria is actually appropriate, we choose to restrict the domain in a way that simplifies the choice of the sign in computations involving the inverse trigonometric functions. And this explains the strange restriction for the domains of the secant and cosecant functions that we're going to see. You have to keep in mind that the inverse secant, inverse cosecant, and inverse cotangent functions don't actually occur very often because these inverse functions do not actually occur in trigonometry all that often because we can always take secant, cosecant, or cotangent and express them in terms of sine, cosine, or tangent, and then we can find the inverse function that way. So you'll have inverse sine, inverse cosine, and inverse tangent functions occur far more often than you would have inverse secant, inverse cosecant, and inverse cotangent functions. So the following graphs are secant, cosecant, and cotangent functions on the restricted domains and also the graphs of the inverse trigonometric functions. So the following graphs are on the left side are the restricted secant function, restricted cosecant function, and the restricted cotangent function. And the graphs that are on the right are the inverse secant function, inverse cosecant function, and the inverse cotangent function. So let's start by talking about the restricted secant function. The restricted secant function is the one that's in red. So you actually restrict the secant function to be this domain, close interval 0 to pi over 2, not including pi over 2, union, pi to 3 pi over 2, including pi, but not including 3 pi over 2. And that's because you want to include x equals 0, because that actually is defined at x equals 0 for the secant function, and x equals pi is defined for the secant function, but x equals pi over 2 and x equals 3 pi over 2 are not defined because those are vertical asymptotes. And notice that the range of this restricted secant function actually attains every single value on this restricted domain. The range is from negative infinity to negative 1, including negative 1, and also union from y equals 1 to infinity, including positive 1. So this is the domain of the restricted secant function. That becomes the range of the inverse secant function, and the range of the restricted secant function becomes the domain of the inverse secant function. So if you take this graph and reflect it across the line y equals x, you get the inverse secant function. Notice that vertical asymptotes x equals pi over 2 and x equals 3 pi over 2 become horizontal asymptotes y equals pi over 2 and y equals 3 pi over 2. And the inverse secant function, y equals inverse secant of x, the domain is from negative infinity to negative 1, close brackets on negative 1, union 1 to infinity, including 1. And the range is from 0 to pi over 2, including 0, union pi to 3 pi over 2, including pi. 
but not including pi over 2 and not including 3 pi over 2. And so this is the graph of the inverse secant function. Now let's talk about the restricted cosecant function. y equals cosecant of x is actually this graph. Well, if you restrict the cosecant function so it becomes a one-to-one -one function, we'll restrict the domain to be this. 0 to pi over 2, including pi over 2, but not including 0. Union, pi to 3 pi over 2, not including pi, but does include 3 pi over 2. And again, this is because at x equals 0, you do have a vertical asymptote, so you can't include x equals 0. But you do want to include x equals pi over 2, because the y value is positive 1. And then you don't include x equals pi, because that's a vertical asymptote, x equals pi. And then you do want to include x equals 3 pi over 2, because the y value is negative 1. And the range is from negative infinity to negative 1, and also 1 to infinity, including y equals negative 1, and also including y equals positive 1. So if you take this graph that's in red, the restricted cosecant function, and reflect it across the line y equals x, you get the inverse cosecant function, which is this graph. Notice that you have a vertical asymptote at x equals pi for the restricted cosecant function. That becomes y equals pi for a horizontal asymptote for the inverse cosecant function. The domain is from negative infinity to negative 1 and 1 to infinity, including the endpoints. And the range is from 0 to pi over 2, including pi over 2, but not including 0. Union, pi to 3 pi over 2, not including pi, but you do include 3 pi over 2. And so this is the graph of the inverse cosecant function. The domain of the restricted cosecant function becomes the range of the inverse cosecant function, and the range of the restricted cosecant function becomes the domain of the inverse cosecant function. And let's finish up this video by talking about how do you actually define the inverse cotangent function. So you start with the restricted cotangent function. So the cotangent function actually looks like this. It actually has a period of pi and it repeats itself every pi radians. So we will restrict the domain between x equals 0 and x equals pi because that's actually one period of the cotangent function. So y equals cotangent of x. The domain, the restricted domain, will be from 0 to pi radians, not including 0 and not including x equals pi because those are vertical asymptotes. But the range of the cotangent function is actually from negative infinity to infinity. So this restricted cotangent function actually obtains every output value on this restricted domain between 0 and pi. And so if you take this graph of the restricted cotangent function and reflect it across the line y equals x, you get the inverse cotangent function, which is this graph. Notice you have a vertical asymptote x equals 0 and x equals pi for the restricted cotangent function. That becomes a horizontal asymptote y equals 0 and a horizontal asymptote y equals pi for the inverse cotangent function. The domain of the restricted cotangent function was from 0 to pi. That becomes the range of the inverse cotangent function. And the range was from negative infinity to infinity for the restricted cotangent function. That becomes the domain of the inverse cotangent function. And so this is the graph of the inverse cotangent function. So like I said earlier, the inverse secant, inverse cosecant, and inverse cotangent functions do not actually occur in trigonometry all that often because you actually can take secant, cosecant, and cotangent and change them to be in terms of sine, cosine, and tangent, and then find the inverse function that way. So this finishes our video on the other four inverse trigonometric functions and their graphs. We talked about how to understand and use the inverse tangent function, how to find the exact value of expressions involving the inverse trigonometric functions. We also used the calculator to evaluate inverse trigonometric functions. And we also talked about the graph of the inverse tangent function. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on homework for this section, please let me know as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about inverse trigonometric functions and right triangles.